Berlin, symbol of the political struggles of the 20th century. Focus of modern confrontations between the superpowers of East and West. To Berlin, the search for the Trojan War now returns. And for the first time, it leads to documentary sources for Homer's story. In our search for the Trojan War, we now come to perhaps the most sensational evidence of all, a prehistoric Foreign Office archive in which, on the face of it, we could actually have letters written to Agamemnon himself, a treaty with Paris, the lover of Helen of Troy, and even in the most dramatic of all recent finds, a fragmentary diplomat's report concerning the war itself. According to Greek legend, as told in Homer's epic poem, The Iliad, Agamemnon, king of Mycenae in Greece, led a great expedition against Troy, a city in Asia Minor. The war was fought to punish the seizure of a Greek queen, Helen, by the Trojan prince Paris. Homer says Agamemnon was a great king and had allies from all over Greece and the islands. After ten years' war, Troy fell, and its royal family, including Paris, was wiped out. But is it possible that the love affair of Paris and Helen was really, as the ancients thought, a pretext for a struggle between ancient superpowers of East and West? And if it was, why has it apparently left no trace in the historical record? The late Bronze Age, the 13th century BC, was a time of great empires in the Near East. Babylon, ancient but now declining, Assyria, a rising militarist power in what is now Iraq, Egypt, ruled for most of the century by the great builder, Ramses II, and lastly, the Hittites, in what is now Turkey, ruling from the Egyptian frontier all the way to the Aegean Sea. And it is the Hittites who are the key to this stage of our search. Boazkoy, in the mountains 200 miles east of Ankara, Turkey. In the Bronze Age, this was the capital of the Hittite Empire, Hattusas. In the 13th century BC, when legend says Paris lived in Troy and Agamemnon in Greece, this was one of the great cities of the world. Then these hills were covered by temples, houses, and a huge royal residence on the great fort where ambassadors were received from Egypt and Babylon.
In a secluded rock cleft nearby was the private chapel of the Hittite emperors who lived at the time of the Trojan War. Here they prayed to the great gods of Hatti, chief among them, fittingly in this wild place, the Storm God. It was at Boazkoi that a discovery was made which has potentially sensational implications for our search. A diplomatic archive written on clay tablets. This was just one of the archives here at Boazkoi. There were in fact several and one temple archive has been discovered as recently as 1983. But this was the key diplomatic archive. It still bears the marks of the destruction, the fire which swept Boazkoi in about 1180 BC. You can see here the burned remains reddened by that final fire. It was here in 1906 that the Germans made perhaps the single most significant discovery in Anatolian archaeology. The find of about 2,500 baked clay tablets inscribed with cuneiform writing scattered all over this area and in these rooms. As luck would have it, the find included Hittite foreign office records covering the very period of the Trojan War. But at that moment, no one could read them. After their discovery, the Boazkoi tablets were removed to Berlin, which became the center of research into the Hittites. There, at the end of the First War, the Hittite language was deciphered. Soon afterwards, in the Pergamon Museum in what is now East Berlin, a young Swiss scholar was working on the translation of one group of tablets. His name was Emil Forer. What Forer saw next, in the little study room of the museum, was one of the most remarkable of all discoveries in the search for Troy. Peering at the cuneiform writing, he started to see strange versions of names he knew all too well from Homer. Here, apparently, were repeated references to the land of the Achaeans, Homer's word for the Greeks. Here was Troy itself, Atreus, the father of Agamemnon, even Alexandros of Ilios, Homer's other name for Paris, the prince who carried off Helen of Troy herself. For Forer, born a few years after the death of Heinrich Schliemann, it seemed perfectly likely that these tablets should mention the Greeks as an important state. What more natural that alongside the great powers of the ancient Near East should have been Schliemann's golden Mycenae? Schliemann, after all, had shown that Mycenae was the richest and most powerful kingdom in Bronze Age Greece, with its immense royal tombs and the coat of arms of the house of Agamemnon above its gate. In a palace here, thought Forer, had ruled a Greek great king, a fringe member of the select diplomatic club of the ancient Near East. To him, the Hittite emperor wrote, as a brother and an equal. The theory was daring and exciting, too exciting perhaps, 
By the 1930s, it had been thrown out by the academic world as unproved speculation. But are the Greeks in the Hittite texts? In this stage of our search, we shall try to show that they are, and that the legend of the Trojan War could go back to real events towards 1260 BC, recorded by the Hittite emperor Hattusilis III. First, we must remember that since the decipherment in 1952 of the Greek Linear B texts, we now know what Emil Forer's generation did not. The Bronze Age rulers of Mycenae were Achaean Greeks, as Homer says. We also now know that the Greeks had relations at ambassadorial level with at least one of the superpowers, Egypt. Here at Egyptian Thebes, now Karnak, Cretan and Greek traders had unloaded their wares for two centuries. And an inscription found here recently shows that Egyptian foreign relations experts knew about the towns of Greece, especially Mycenae. But can the Egyptians tell us what status the Greek kingdoms had in this world of Near Eastern diplomacy? An expert in Bronze Age international relations at Liverpool University, Dr. Ken Kitchen. Is it possible to guess at what the Egyptian attitude to the Mycenaean Greeks might have been? Uh, just foreigners on the edge of civilization would be their view, <laughs> quite simply. The outer rim of the world which they knew. There was Egypt in the middle, with the Nubians and the peoples of Punt to the south, the Libyans to the west, the ancient Near East uh, of uh, Canaan and the great powers of Assur and Babylon out to the east and the north, and Hattie on the north, and right out on that northern edge, the Hau Nebu, these little islands of foreigners, uh, what we call the Greeks and others, uh, right on the outer margins. And, we, and we, <coughs> we talk about the great powers of the day, but I mean, was there a grading of the sort of superpowers uh, and the lesser ones? Very definitely, yes. Uh, you had to have certain achievements, presumably warlike successes and things of that kind, or a certain level of empire, to take the formal title of great king. So there's a definite set of kings who would be recognized as superpowers of the day. There was Egypt, there was the Hittite kingdom, uh, Babylon traditionally had been one, and Assyria claimed it from the Hittites when she conquered a Hittite province, which did not amuse the, Assyri the Hittites at all. <laughs> she said, uh, the, Hittite, the Assyrian king said, I am great king now, my brother. And the Hittite king wrote back in fury as he'd lost the province, don't you brother me. <laughs> Uh, in effect, are we sons of the same mother, was his bitter remark. Mm. So there's a very definite superpower status. But according to Homer's Iliad, Agamemnon had just such status. He was a great king, not only of mainland Greece, but of many islands including Crete and Rhodes. If this is true, was it recorded by the diligent and expert diplomats of the Hittite Foreign Office? Homer insists that the Bronze Age Greeks called themselves Achaeans, Achaewoi. But the Hittites speak of a powerful kingdom to the west called Achiawa. Are they the Greeks? Where was Achiawa? There are many theories. Was it perhaps in Thrace, present-day Bulgaria? Could it have been an Anatolian state based at Troy itself? Was it an island kingdom, for example Rhodes, which was colonized by Greeks? Or could it be a mainland Achaean Greek power, perhaps centering on Mycenae itself, as Homer's tale would suggest? The Hittite archive gives us several key facts about Akiawa. It was a seagoing state with wide contacts. Relations with the Hittites were at times friendly, at times hostile. Most important, the Hittite Foreign Office viewed Akiawa as a top-ranking power around the time of the Trojan War, for they addressed its ruler as a great king. And that brings us to this fascinating document. 
This is a rough draft of a solemn treaty made up between the Hittites and the Syrian state of Amuru. It was drawn up for the Emperor Tudhaliash IV, probably around 1220 BC, probably after the Trojan War. And in it are fascinating lines where Tudhaliash names the kings who were of the top rank, the kings on the same rank as himself. Lugal Uru Mizri, the king of Egypt, Lugal Kur Karduniash, the king of Babylon, Lugal Kur Ashur, the king of Assyria, and Lugal Kur Akiava, the king of Akiava. But tantalizingly, the scribe has crossed out the word Akiava before the clay had even dried. There are only two conclusions we can draw from that. One is that the king of Akiawa was no longer of the front rank in world politics. The second, and uh, simpler, is that uh, the, the terms of this treaty, which is only a rough draft, were not meant to apply to him. But either way, it would seem that this mysterious king was a great figure in Eastern Mediterranean politics. But was he a Greek king? Some scholars totally reject the Mycenaean connection. James Mellot of the University of London. Of course, there's no evidence of uh, what they called themselves at all. We do not know. I think in this case, before we jump... We do know they were Greek, though, now, we, we? know that they were Greek because the texts are in Greek. Well, if I was going to argue for um, uh, the Greeks being the kingdom of Akiah, well, I would say, well, uh, uh, here we have clearly a a major kingdom to the west of the, of the Hittite sphere of influence, uh, a kingdom which interferes militarily and diplomatically with the Hittites on their western fringe. It's a, a kingdom that sends ships trading with Syria, uh, a kingdom which even has exchanges of royal family occasionally, so they've got friendly relations. Now, all that seems to me to fit the, uh, uh, the Greeks very well. It's quite a plausible model. Why don't you think that it's plausible? Uh, plausible is the word you stress. <laughs> uh, I think what is becoming a rather an irony is that whereas Mycenaean archaeologists have now almost reached the point where they say that there was no such thing as a great Mycenaean state with a lot of small ones all fighting each other, uh, on the basis of a f one, literally, one reference in Hattusili's letter to the king of Achiyama where he calls him my brother and therefore he's a great king, uh, We've got a bit of a contradiction here. Uh, all right, you can no doubt, I mean, link this to Agamemnon, etc., etc., but I don't think anybody in recent years has tried to... Uh, you could easily argue it on the basis of the archaeology, though, couldn't you? Looking at Pylos, Mycenae, Knossos, there's a good argument for the same culture down to the minutest details of the Linear B form, Indeed, but uh, hardly a united kingdom. A whole series of kingdoms, quite clearly. Mm. And that is not the sort of thing, I mean, one might expect from the Mycenaean side. Mm -hmm. No overlord of the whole lot. Not even, not even in Homer's Iliad. Agamemnon plays very much second fiddle to Achilles. We're in the narrow seas between the coast of Turkey and the Greek islands opposite. A place which has been a cultural crossroads for 3,000 years. For longer than civilization has existed, ordinary people, men, women, their belongings and children, have crossed here to try and uh, settle and scratch a living. In the time that legend assigns the Trojan War, we know now that the islands which we call Greek, like Kos, opposite us, were already settled by Greeks, and that the Greeks had already got their foothold on the shores of Asia Minor, as in places like this one, Halicarnassos, now Bodrum with its great crusader castle. This was a slave market in Mycenaean times. From this place, raw materials and slaves were exported to mainland Greece by a rich colonial middle class whose cemeteries have been discovered. And it was places like this which were the potential flashpoints in the late Bronze Age Aegean world of the 13th century BC.
Recently, archaeology has given fresh clues confirming the Greek presence on the fringe of the Hittite world. Their pottery has been found in 30 places. In Greek Linear B tablets, six place names have so far been identified where the Greeks took Asian slave women. Most important, three places in southwest Turkey have now revealed evidence of Greeks actually living in Asia Minor. Chief among them was Miletus. Once the greatest of all Greek cities in Asia, Miletus now lies abandoned, its lifeblood drained away when the Meander River silted up its harbours. In the late Bronze Age, around 1300 BC, Miletus stood on a sea-girt promontory. It was fortified with a circuit wall enclosing an area larger than Mycenae. Almost all the evidence is now obliterated, but a palatial building stood on a low hill inside the town. Nearby are the remains of typically Greek chamber tombs, a well-to-do cemetery where rich citizens of Miletus were buried with Greek grave goods imported from Mycenae. The question arises, exactly what kind of place was Miletus in the late Bronze Age? It would be tempting to call it a Mycenaean colony, but it's not as simple as that. It was obviously a place where many races met. People of Anatolian, Carian origin, people of Cretan origin, uh, Greeks, maybe even a sprinkling of Hittites. A Hittite pilgrim flask has turned up here. So it was a cosmopolitan place. But there must have been a strong central authority because only a strong authority and one with money and influence could have built that great circuit wall around the low promontory which was Mycenaean Miletus there. And presumably that authority lived in the palatial building on that hill. But was that central authority Greek? Was Miletus even ruled from mainland Greece? Its name seems to appear in Greek Linear B tablets as a place from which the mainland Greek rulers imported Asian slave women. The Greeks called it Milatos, earlier perhaps Milwatos. But according to the Hittite Foreign Office, there was a city on the western coast of Asia Minor, controlled by the foreign power of Akiawa, a city they called Milawanda, later Milawata. And the Hittites and Akiawa had a major diplomatic crisis over this place. Are Miletus and Milawanda the same? If we can prove they are, then Akiawa can only be mainland Greece. And in the surviving tablets in East Berlin, we begin to glimpse a story with a modern ring. A story of political jostling between superpowers who were willing to sacrifice lesser states to political expediency. 
The hidden workings of such diplomacy are difficult enough to fathom today. The true meaning of the words themselves often elusive. But the Hittite tablet describing the Milawanda affair needs to be listened to carefully, complicated though its story is, for it is the turning point in our search. This letter contains our crucial evidence for this stage of the search. It's the office copy of a letter written by the Hittite Emperor Hattushalish III to an unnamed king of Akiawa, we think of Greece, around the year 1250 BC, about the time of the Trojan War. It's known as the Tawakalawash letter, but in fact its subject is a villain called Piamaradush. And I'm afraid we'll have to put up with a few uh, unpronounceable names at this point in our story. But it's worth remembering that in Hittite eyes, Pierre Maradouche is quite simply the baddie. Evidently, he was a powerful, dispossessed royal adventurer operating somewhere off the coasts of western Anatolia. In collusion with Akiawa, we think the Greeks, and in collusion with none other than the brother of the king of the Greeks himself, whom the Hittites called Tawakalawash. Pierre Maradouche had evidently once been a Hittite subject, but now he's terrorizing their local allies in the West and breaking up the network of alliances built up by Hittite diplomacy, by the, the men of Hattushalit's foreign office. The center of the trouble is a city that the Hittites called Milawanda or Milawata, somewhere on the western coast, and it was controlled by Akiawa, the Greeks. Eventually, Hattushilish has to journey all the way across from Boazkoi to sort these events out himself. And this is the letter that he wrote to the Greek king explaining his actions. In it, he gives the names of a number of places that he travelled through on his way to the west. And these are they. Most of them uh, cannot be identified. The only safe one is the first, the Hittite capital Hattushash, the starting point. But if we could only pin the others down on the ground, we'd have a marvellous chance of showing that the Greeks really are in this archive. And that would have incalculable effects for our search for the Trojan War. So finding Milawanda is the next stage of the search. The empire administered from Hattusas depended on its ability to protect its distant provinces. And Hattusilish was not a man to refuse the challenge of a villain like Pia Maradouche. Now around 60, brother of the late king, Hattusilish had been a sickly child, but by great willpower had become the Hittite's best general. And then, when he deposed his unpopular nephew, great king himself, as he put it, with the blessing of the storm god. Now in still powerful middle age, politician and generalissimo, Hattushilish was a shrewd if tetchy diplomat and a dangerous enemy. And with the outer provinces of his empire threatened, he had to act. One spring day, in around 1250 BC, he set out for the west. into the journey, the letter says Hattushilish reached the road junction of Salata, probably modern Sivri Hissar, a hundred miles west of Ankara. Here he was met by his son, who brought bad news. A conciliatory offer to Pia Maradouche had been curtly snubbed.
After Salapa, the main western road ran as it still does to the modern town of Afion, the Hittite fortress of Hapanua. administrative center of the Roman and Ottoman empires, Afion still has great blocks of prehistoric defenses under the medieval castle on its fairy tale crag. But which way do we go from here? Hattushalish obviously knows where he's going, but we don't. All we know is that he's going westwards towards the coast. But the coast of Asia Minor is a very big place. And uh, uh, really, this is our crunch here in Afion, because uh, from here we have to make the decision as to whether we're going to go up towards the Sea of Marmara in the northwest, near the region of Troy itself, to look for Milawanda. Are we going to go directly westwards towards modern Izmir? Or are we going to go down into the southwestern corner opposite the, the Greek islands of Kos and Rhodes? To me, the evidence for the southwestern location is absolutely overwhelming. The question centers on the people that the Hittites and Hattushalish called the Luka people who called in Hattushalish all the way from Boazkoi uh, to help them. Are they the people who later lived in what was known as Lycia, today Lycia, this southwestern coastal area? Well, they also appear in the guise of pirates raiding Cyprus down here, which is really barely conceivable if they lived up in the Sea of Marmara. But most interesting of all, a number of the towns in Lycia seem to have preserved their names from Hittite times all the way through to classical times, uh, a thousand years or more. So I think that the, uh, the Luka people are to be found in this southwestern area known later as Lycia, and that, I think, is where Hattushalish headed, and that's where we're going to go. Easy to imagine the bustle as Hattushalish gave the order to depart. The troops singing their marching song, the royal kinsman, the wine master, Sahurunwas, the master of the scribes on wood, Kamalias, the head cook, and the rest of the king's immense retinue. Drive the modern route to the Aegean from Afion, and you're on the line of the Roman and Persian roads, and probably the Hittite before them. It is one of the immemorial travel routes through Anatolia. Four hundred miles into the journey, the arid landscape of the central Anatolian plateau gives way to the fertile valley of the Meander, the greatest of the rivers of Asia Minor. The place is now called Pamukkale. Here, the ancient road descended into the river plain before heading west on the last leg towards the Aegean Sea and the Greek world. Pressing onto the sea, which way did Hattushalish go now? There are two choices today. The modern main road straight west to the coast, the ancient road which turns abruptly southwards away from the sea. Take the southern route and you soon reach a fertile plain and the ruins of a city called Alabanda. The name matches the first place Hattushalish came to in the Luka lands, Valivanda.
Hattusheli's letter now gives us another clue. The next place he reached was a fortress called Ialanda on a steep and waterless height. If we're on the right track, then Ialanda lay somewhere in these hills, and Hattusilis soon found out that it was dangerous country. I was attacked there in three places. Now the hill of Ialanda is very steep, and difficult to attack, so I dismounted and went up on foot. I smashed the enemy there. I took many prisoners and I devastated Yolanda. To find the site of Hattusilis' victory, you have to leave the car just as the emperor left his chariot and climb to the summit on foot. Here, high above the ancient route to the Aegean, is a forbidding hill, precipitous and waterless. The classical builders had to construct an aqueduct to supply it. This natural fortress was sieged only with great difficulty by Alexander the Great himself a thousand years later. Under its tremendous classical ruins lie earlier defences. It is called Alinda. Again, the Hittite name survived until later times. So we are on Hattusilis' track, and somewhere not far ahead lie the villainous Piamaradush and his shadowy foreign master, the King of Akiawa. Such thoughts were on Hattusilis' mind as he camped nearby, for now he had his scribe write again to the Akiawan king. My brother, I'll tell you exactly what happened. As we were short of water, I divided my forces and left my 7,000 prisoners under light guard. But Pia Maradush seized them. I would have let bygones be bygones, but for that. My brother, I wrote to him a last time, asking him to come here to me. And I write to you, asking whether you know of his attacks on me. I have done all this before I cross over into your territory around Milawanda. Camped nearby, Hattusilis waited for a reply from Akiawa. Time was running out. The empire needed him elsewhere. But when my brother's envoy arrived at my quarters, he brought me no friendly greeting from you and no customary gift. But he did say that you had instructed your governor in Milawanda to hand over Piamaradush to me. That was what Hattusilis wanted to hear. He would go to Milawanda himself and take Piamaradush. And that, let us remember, involved crossing over a foreign frontier recognized by treaty by his foreign office.
There is only one way Hattushilish can have gone now, northwest towards the sea. The ancient road ran along what is now a great salt lake, Bafagol. Once sea, Lake Baffa has now been cut off from the Aegean by the silting of the meander. But in the Bronze Age, it formed a great gulf around which the land route to the west had to make its long detour through the mountains. Then the meander flowed into an immense bay. And in that bay lay Hattusili's Go, the city of Milawanda, Mycenaean Miletus. Now lying low, baking in the silt plain of the meander, then washed by the sea with a magnificent backdrop of the Greek islands behind. What happened next we have in Hattushilish's own words. And after a week on the road in his company, it was easy to put yourself in his shoes. I entered your city, Milawanda, because I have a few things to say to Pia Maradouche that I think it would be good the rest of your citizens here listen to. But my visit here has not gone very well. I asked to see your brother, Tower Kalawash, and I'm told he's away. I asked to see Pia Maradouche, and I'm told he's taken a ship and gone overseas. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, I receive a letter from you, a letter that can only be described as insolent, adopting a tone barely tolerable between equals, forbidding me, forbidding me, to remove Pia Maradouche from Milawanda. You write to me, my brother, as a great king, as my equal. But in your letter, I do not hear the language of an equal. I am directed... Yes, if I can just say something here, this is very interesting. Hattushilish, throughout his life, was very touchy about the way that he came to the throne because he'd deposed his nephew. And anybody who suggested that he wasn't a genuine great king uh, made him see red. In fact, Ramses II of Egypt had to write to him saying, Look, my brother, of course you're a great king. You've done wonderful things in Hittite land. And don't worry about it. Are you aware, or is it even with your blessing, that Pia Maradouche is going around boasting that he intends to leave his wife, children, and incidentally my 7,000 prisoners under your protection while he continues his piratical raids against my territory? Look, we're friends, you and I. There's been no disagreement between us since the affair over Wilusa, when I'm sure I was able to persuade you that it was no cause for war between us. As for my armed occupation of your town, Milawanda, look upon it as a friendly visit. Hmm? I'm sorry if I appeared impolite or aggressive. It's true I was a little hot-headed in the past. From now on, let's live together in perfect friendship. Thank you. Tremendous, isn't it? Can you imagine any modern government being so reasonable? Reasonable, perhaps, but Hattushilish had little choice. His hold over his western protectorates was now unsteady. In the face of Akiawan command of the sea, he had to be conciliatory towards the great king of Akia land.
For if we have read the Hittite archive right, it was the mainland Greeks who held Miletus, and in the eyes of the Hittite Foreign Office, there was a great king of Greece, just as Homer's tale has it. A king who interfered militarily on the shores of Asia Minor, exactly as the Iliad remembered. And where is more likely for the seat of that power in the 13th century BC than Homer's golden Mycenae? On the face of it, Hattushilish's correspondent could be Agamemnon himself. So there is a new question to ask of the Hittite Foreign Office. Do they have records of Troy? The mound of Troy, called Hisalik, stands on a ridge at the mouth of the Dardanelles in northwest Turkey. It has been excavated three times by the Germans Heinrich Schliemann and Wilhelm Derbfeldt and the American Karl Blagen. It was Derbfeldt who found the great royal citadel now called Troy VI. Its fine walls and towers suggest it was the capital of a medium-sized kingdom. Though an Anatolian city, presumably Anatolian in speech, it had long-time trading relations across the Aegean with Agamemnon's Mycenae. This city was violently destroyed in Hattushilish's day, but the excavators disagreed as to whether the cause was an earthquake or the hand of man. Blagan thought Homer's Troy was the successor to Troy VI, which he called Troy 7A, a city of shanties which fell a few decades later. But was either of these cities the Troy of the Trojan War? And can the Hittite texts help us decide the question? In the Iliad, Homer calls the city by two names, Troia and more often Ilios, originally pronounced Wilios. Now in this general area, an earlier Hittite tablet names two places, Tarwisa and next to it, Willusia. At the time of the Trojan War, they may have come within an important state called Willusa, and according to Emperor Hattusilish, it was over this state that the Hittites actually came to blows with the Greeks was Willusa Troy. In the British Museum, another fragment of a Hittite tablet from Boazkoi gives further clues about the historical kingdom in western Anatolia, which may lie behind the city in the Iliad. It is a treaty between the king of Willusa and Hattusili's brother, which could put it into the period of the Trojan War. The Hittite emperor demands military aid from his western ally in time of war. If either son am called out on campaign, says the Hittite king, these campaigns are obligatory from Hattusas. Uh, if the king of Egypt or Assyria marches against me and I write to you for chariots and infantry, you must come and help. Uh, now, that treaty dates from about the time of the great battle at Kadesh, in between the Hittites and the Egyptians, in which the Egyptian intelligence department had information that among the Hittite Western allies were a people known as Dardani, the very name Homer gives to the people of Troy. It really is a coincidence that uh, can't be avoided. And in that case, uh, the next coincidence is really quite extraordinary because on this treaty, the name of the prince of Willusa is Alexandush, strikingly recalling Homer's name for the prince of Willios, Alexandros, Paris, the lover of Helen of Troy himself. Alexandros is the usual name given by Homer to Paris, 
and a tradition survived in the ancient world in Anatolia that the Hittite ally was indeed Helen's lover. If he was, then, ironically enough, he would have been well into his fifties, not the young Adonis of Greek tradition, the girl-crazy playboy described by Homer. Instead, a grizzled veteran of 30 years of battles from Syria to the Aegean. At that point, he vanishes, and his city is plunged into disaster. What happened? Is there, after all, a grain of historical truth behind the tale of the most famous seduction in history? To find out, we must return to the Hittite archive in Berlin for a last time. And from these fragmentary Cold War messages 3,000 years old, a possible story can be reconstructed. The story of a state caught between two great powers and eventually dismembered by their rivalry. Putting together several tablet fragments, the story could be this. Soon after Hattushilish seized the throne, in 1263 BC, some of his western protectorates were persuaded to renounce allegiance, relying on the great king of Greece against the Hittites. But Wilusa, which could be Troy, was loyal to the Hittites. It was attacked. Its royal family were killed or exiled. The final clue uh, is the most interesting of all, and it's only been discovered in 1982, when a hitherto unassigned fragment lying in the collection here in Berlin was seen to make a perfect join with a, a well-known letter of Hattushilish's son, Tudhaliash IV. That would make it about 1220, 1230 BC, probably not long after the Trojan War. By then, we learn from the letter, Alexandush of Wilusa is dead. The Hittites have uh, uh, put a puppet king in his place, a man called Walmu, and he in his turn has been deposed. Tudhaliash takes up the story. Unfortunately, it's full of blanks. And further troops, he says, blank. And somebody went. And he blank by night down. Blank. And the land was not blank. And when its lord, blank, heard the news, blank, he fled. And they put another lord over themselves, whom I did not recognize, the wicked one. But the letters of credential, the documents which I made for Walmu, they kept. It was in my father's day that these troubles began. Then war was declared and the enemy relied on the king of Greece. The land of Wilusa was attacked, and Hittite troops were brought west. And as they relied on the king of Greece, the great king of Hatti advanced, and he subdued them, and brought great booty back to Hattusas. Is the true fall of Troy, then, to be found in the Hittite archive?
Taking the Hittite view, the disturbances out here in Western Anatolia must have seemed uncannily like what we today call the domino theory in Central America or Eastern Europe. The diplomatic fabric patiently built up by their foreign office experts over two centuries was now being torn apart. They could no longer guarantee the sovereignty of their most far-flung protectorate. As for Troy, if it was Wilusa, it had been loyal to the Hittites for 400 years. And if our Hittite version of the Trojan War is even something like the truth, it is not hard to imagine how they felt. This marvelous city of Troy VI maintained its cultural separateness for 500 years, and probably its political separateness too. They must have been very astute kings, the men who built these wonderful walls. But they looked westwards. Their main imports seem to have been from Mycenae itself. The Greeks, on the other side, looked this way. They, as we've seen, were trying to uh, catch a foothold on the coast of Anatolia, uh, looking for metals, raw materials, slaves, perhaps even to carve out petty kingdoms. And that, I'm sure, was why the Hittites came in over to this side. The Hittites were quite prepared to acknowledge that the area of Miletus, Milawanda, might be in the Greek area of influence. But this part of the world, with the related kingdoms of Wilusa and Arzawa, was certainly, let there be no doubt about it, in the Hittite diplomatic sphere. And they came in for security reasons, a good uh, reason for intervention that we understand well today. And so the crisis that had been brewing between those two superpowers came to a head. And I think we can imagine worried ambassadors scurrying through this gate to report to their king. And in the course of a campaign in which perhaps many cities were sacked, this citadel fell. But whether it was Troy VI with its beautiful walls and its fine houses, or Troy VII-A with its shanties and its soup kitchen, I'm no longer sure. I'm not certain anymore about the earthquake that Carl Blagan thought levelled Troy VI, or the date for that matter. In fact, the questions still stand. Who sacked Troy? The retreating Greeks? The Hittites? Or someone else? And which Troy? <laughs>